so we have our five uh, speakers uh, with us at the table. And the two chairs of the day will uh, be the boss. Well, I'll be the assistant boss. <laughs> and Elizabeth will be the main boss. Uh, I had a, dis a short discussion with Elizabeth in the, the room uh, outside. And we were thinking that there are a few common denominators that go th that went through the different speeches. So it's just a suggestion, an invitation to uh, discuss in the following direction. Uh, well, I think that Paul has raised an important question. Was, is there a difference between inference and reasoning? And what's the place of logic in these things? Is there an important difference between reasoning in general and logical reasoning? Uh, what's the place of reasoning and inference and logic in human cognition? And uh, when people reason, do they reason mostly with monotonic procedures or non-monotonic procedures? And also when the scientists want to model human reasoning, should they refer to formal languages that are monotonic or non-monotonic? I would say that it's approximately, I forgot something. It no. shows in your face. No, no, I was just gonna say, all that in 30 minutes. You're really getting your money's worth right now. <laughs> I doubt we'll get to all that, but that's the. And now I'm the assistant boss and she's the boss. No, I'm not, I'm not the boss. What do you, what, what do you want to start with? What do you want to start with? The last thing he mentioned was the non-monotonic question, which I think is, is really interesting and important. The idea that reasoning or thinking is monotonic fits well with a logical point of view, because if you think of deductive inference, you should just be able to keep on piling theorem after theorem. But way back in the 70s, this view was challenged. It was challenged by Marvin Minsky in artificial intelligence. It was challenged by Gilbert Harmon in philosophy, quite independently of other. And both of them provided really obvious examples where you don't, in fact, keep on piling on what you've known. I was most convinced of this when looking at the history of science. The history of science is extraordinarily non-monotonic because you've got views like creationism, which was dominant in 1800. By 1900, because of Darwin's theories of evolution, you've given it up. So I think from all the arguments you get from the history of science and from, from Darwin and from Minsky and from Harmon, the idea that we should think of reasoning as monotonic is just a mistake. Okay. But Many of our lecturers today and yesterday did not oppose logic and non-monotonic reasoning. And we, we had, for, for example, Keith Stenning yesterday, who, who presented a system of non-monotonic logic to model human cognition. But I'm sure that LDB will go in that direction. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think uh, it is also a mistake to oppose logic to uh, non-monotonic reasoning. We have 40 years on of non-monotonic logic with well-developed formalism that uh, explain how and when uh, non-monotonicity occur. So uh, there's no opposition here, I think. Sure. I mean, just Google Scholar non-monotonic logic, you will end up with tons of Work. Yeah, but that's what McCarthy did in response to in response to Minsky. He said Minsky says logic is uh, reasoning is non-monotonic, and he was attacking formal logic. So McCarthy, oh, we'll build a non-monotonic logic, but does it actually do it very well? He put in a special operator. I think there's way better ways of modeling the non-monotonicity of human thought. I do it with my coherence models. I mean, they're computationally tractable, and like a lot of these deductive things, which get into all sorts of computational problems, you just have a whole bunch of ideas that are related to each other. You maximize coherence in an extremely efficient way, a way that maps onto the way the brain works, and so you get the non-monotonicity, not by putting a special operator into it, but it just emerges from the parallel operation of the neural network. That's 
doesn't require any special operator. It's efficient and I think much more human. Well, do I need to, d I think I should now defend monotonic logic <laughs> <laughs> because there's some no opposition here. But I mean, you yeah, know, I think, uh, I mean, obviously I believe that, um, you know, we, we, uh, you know, good logic for many aspects of our everyday reasoning should be uh, uh, non-monotonic. I mean, I think that, you know, the case still, I mean, at least, you know, certain kind of examples are not as clear cut as what originally thought. I mean, like, you know, standard examples that you get for example, is like, you know, um, with um, reasoning with defeasible generalizations. So, you know, you might think obviously reasoning is non monotonic because I say, for example, you know, birds fly, yeah, um, Tweety is a bird, so conclusion Tweety flies. Um, but, you know, add the information that Tweety is actually a penguin, then you're no longer going to be, uh, uh, then you're not going to say, okay, um, uh, Tweety flies anymore. So that's one of these kind of, you know, poster examples of um, non-monotonic lines of um, reasoning and so on. I mean, I, I just wanted to point out so that we get a little bit of a, I mean, I, I on a, are on the non-monotonic side, but there are some avenues for resistance here, so just, you know, for completeness. I mean, you could say that these kind of, um, well, the, the claim that birds fly, I mean, if you want to interpret it in such a way that it actually does license the inference, it's actually false. I mean, you know, in order to get the inference, you would need to interpret it as, all birds fly, which isn't true, obviously. If you interpret this as true, then you know maybe you would want to say that most birds fly, and that together with Tweety being a bird does not license that Tweety flies and so on. So um, I think that um, there are some potential avenues for resistance here about um, certain kind of um, um, uh, too quick arguments in favor of a non-monotonic uh, logic. I think that you know there is some. We can pile up cases, um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it, you know, it needs some work to show that really. I mean, I think that's yeah, just wanted to point that out here for the audience. Okay. Yes, this is uh, this is what what I think. Also, I, I believe this is a kind of a false opposition. Uh, as long as um, it all depends on the kind of reasoning you want to model. Right. For instance, if, if you want, if uh, the kind of object or structure you want to, mod to model formally allows for informational increase, you have to pick a consequence relation that will do the same thing. So you will go non-monotonic in this case. But if you want to model inference engine, for instance, for particular kinds of reasoning, maybe you will stick with monotonic reasoning and strongly stick with monotonic reasoning. So it all boils down to the same thing. When you do modal logic, which one is preferable? S4, S5, for epistemic logic, for what reasons? Well, I'm not sure it's very relevant question in the first place. Uh, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what kind What's the use? <laughs> what's the use and what kind of thing we want to model with this formally? And after that, we, we pick the right system with the right behavior. Huh? Well, let's move to that. What are the pairings of the right system with the right behavior? I mean, given that we've been talking about possibly a difference between reasoning or inference or, you know, if we're, if we're divvying this up, what are the right things for the right people? Well, <laughs> I, I think the choice of which modal logic is none of the above. Because <laughs> I don't think any of them have any relation to things we want to reason about. Part of them is questions of, uh, of computational feasibility. Uh, you had in your epistemic logic the KK principle. If you know it, then you know that you know it. Well, if you've got that axiom, then you know an infinite number of things. Well, we don't have an infinite number of brain cells, and no computer can do it either. So it's not computationally feasible if you have that, and it's not something that any real organism could do. That's why I called it the psychology of God. And so that seems to me that that whole set of, of systems where you can license an infinite number of inferences is obviously not part of cognitive science. It might be an interesting mathematical exercise, but I don't think you're handling anything that's relevant to human knowledge. Shall we talk about KK or? <laughs> well, remember the computational argument. Yeah, yeah, sure. So my answer as a model logician is all of the above. So, <laughs> I mean, 
I would, so there are some well-known representation theorem that shows that a large class of computation that can be done by a neural network is representable as non-monotonic inference in the sense of uh, what Malte was presenting us this morning. So they're just two sides of the same coin. So there is just no opposition here. Uh, and that's fine. So I, I don't see what's the big uh, opposition again. I mean, so, and, and the computational thing, I mean, it's important to understand was the, in the case of knowledge, for instance, um, I think both Malte and Eve, you were very careful to, to define knowledge as something you're either committed to or something you have an epistemic argument for uh, or, or a justification for, uh, not necessarily something you have in your head, right? And you were talking about a radical externalist. So from that point of view, uh, the fact that you're committed to an infinite number of propositions is absolutely no problem, right? Because I, I don't have them in my head. I just, I'm just committed to answer yes to anyone who would say, do you agree with that, right? Okay. That's fine. Yeah, building up a little bit on that, I mean, I think it is really important. I think that came out a little bit in the um, uh, Q and A. Um, also, I mean, I think there is a there is just you know, we need to distinguish between um, um, yeah commitment and um, or you know what 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 your logic um, allows you to infer and actually doing the inferences um, or what it prescribes and whether or not you really do follow up on the um, prescription. I think, uh, and, and I wanted, in this connection, I mean, I wanted to point out, I mean, like, um, since this is what, in the afternoon, which I think was very interesting. Um, but, I mean, I also felt that, you know, so there was this little bit, um, little bit on Aristotle. There was like this little bit in, um, a little bit of insinuation that Aristotle set us on, on the wrong track here when we were thinking about um, reasoning. I just wanted to point out, and I'm sure you know that, but I think it's, it's, it's important to point out that Aristotle is to some extent like an ally to the afternoon talks because Aristotle said in the Nicomachean Ethics, look, you know, you can be a very good reasoner and still screw up all the time. You can lead a terrible ethical life. Even if you know all the right moral principles and you're very good logician in principle. There's just a difference between um, uh, yeah, n knowing the stuff in your head and actually putting it into your life. And that's why Aristotle was so um, eager to really say that, look, if you want to build a good generation, I mean, a lot of that is actually going to be about on habituation. So I think that really connects here. So it's not enough to teach people logic. It might be important to teach them logic, but that's not going to make them good people. And I think if we distinguish a little bit between um, logic as you know, like a you know theory about a theory about reasoning, right, and you know the ability to actually do reason, which for Aristotle is actually you know practical reasoning is the kind of thing that's going to lead to lead your ethical life, right? I think then the opposition becomes a little bit um, uh, you know less strong here, really. But you know we really something like. We all involved to some extent, you know, to, to making people lead good, good lives, and that involves, on the one hand, knowing the theory, but on the other hand, also being able to put certain theory into practice, and that can take different kind of, uh, you know, that that may take different kind of skills. Yeah. Maybe to jump on this last idea, I mean, this idea that, I mean, so I mean, the importance of the cognitive environments. I mean, in, in my talk, I talked a lot about the sort of good cognitive environments we can put in place, but I didn't insist that a lot of the cognitive environments we're placed in are actually really, really bad for us, right? So when we're in an environment when there's like a McDonald's at every street corner, I mean, making uh, I mean, decisions and what to eat, I mean, that, I mean, that becomes really, really, really hard. Uh, so if, I mean, if you want to I mean, make different decisions and so on, you have to radically change the way your so your habits and so on. So in that sense, right? I mean, so the, I mean, there, there's a d definitely a role in picking out an environment in order to uh, I mean, I mean, change your your habits and so on, and to actually have I mean, the, I mean, these sort of better procedures uh, I mean, take some place in your life. Uh, and I mean, so I, mean, I think that's a really uh, I mean interesting aspect. I mean, I I, I do accept the the connection with. With Aristotle here. <laughs> yeah, let's say something about commitment. So you you gave a, a behaviorist uh, definition of commitment, which is that you're committed to it if you would agree to it. But am I committed to all the logical consequences of my beliefs? What about something which is 17 million symbols long that I can't even comprehend? Am I committed to that? I don't think so. Like that behaviorist that's just not right. What's commitment? What's belief? 
Well, here there's some really interesting work about what the neural processes are that go with belief. You might think that it's something purely cognitive, yes, no, or you might think the way the Bayesians do, that it's a matter of a degree of belief. I don't think either of those maps onto what the brain does. The only studies on this that I know are done by Sam Harris, who's more notorious for his attacks on religion, but he did a PhD in neuroscience at UCLA looking to see what are the neural correlates of belief and disbelief. So he'd ask people something like this, uh, do you believe that Montreal is the capital of Canada? And if it's something obvious, people might go with it, but other people, what, are you an idiot? Well, that's not what they're saying. What's happening is not just what you might think of as some pure, cold, cognitive reaction, it's actually emotional. So when people think that something's false, you get activation in areas of the brain like the amygdala, which associated with negative emotions, whereas if you say something that's actually true, like Ottawa is the capital of Canada, you get activation in areas like the ventral uh, medial uh, prefrontal cortex, which is often connected with positive emotions. So the standard idea of uh, the behaviorist account of commitment I don't think is psychologically realistic, and in fact, the one source of evidence on this suggests very interesting connections between, between believing and liking which don't make sense if you follow the standard view of a distinction between probability and utility, but that's the way our brains are built. Well, that was one aspect of it, and that, that certainly can be described computationally. But I, this seems that one fundamental disagreement here is I think a constraint on any kind of principle of inference or reasoning, if you want, is that it be computational realizable. So a lot of the things we heard about today, things like logical consequence, I mean, that's problematic because it's uh, at least undecidable in the case of predicate calculus. You can't compute that. Uh, calculations of consistency. You want to make sure you're consistent. Well, that's something that grows exponentially with the number of things you're dealing with. How many beliefs do we have? Well, we've got about a vocabulary for educated person of maybe 50,000 words, so you've got at least 50,000 concepts, so probably have 10 beliefs per concept. That would be 500,000. So if you consider the set of all subsets of that that you might want for possible world semantics or check in consistency, that's two to the 500,000. That's more particles than there are in the universe. So this is not something that's computable by any real system. So I don't think you can use this as a, as a reasonable constraint on evaluations of rationality. So that's a different way in which computational considerations get into it. But it's, it's not just parallel versus serial. There's lots of these other things that are a big part of it. Fast versus slow, social versus individual. So I think you need to consider all of those. Well, I think whether we're dealing with digital computers or brains, we're dealing with computational systems. Not everything's a computational system. This cup isn't because it doesn't have any representations or algorithms operating on it. But intelligent systems, as far as we know, are computational. But they can get where they get in very different ways. I think it's really held back artificial intelligence that it's been too much driven by uh, ideas that came out of, out of, out of logic that hasn't paid enough attention to semantics and pragmatics right from the get-go, rather so supposing that you can get to that. That's, that's a, a crucial difference between current digital computers and minds. That's gonna change already with, with uh, Chris Elias Smith's semantic pointer architecture running on real chips in real time and interacting with the world. So we're gonna have robots that are much smarter than current ones because they're working with representations that are semantic and pragmatic at the same time as they're able to do syntax. But syntax alone is not gonna make you very smart.
Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's worth pointing out that, um, I mean, when we talk about commitment, I mean, I think that's to some extent a normative notion, right? And uh, I mean, I, I think there, it is, it is uh, not irresistible to uh, um, demand that, you know, such normative notions such as commitment, obligation, and so on are reducible to questions about um, computability and so on. So, I mean, I think that, you know, I think at least from an um, ordinary um, perspective, we can make perfect sense of the idea of an obligation or a commitment or something like that. Um, independently of you know questions about um, computability, so I mean I think you know we have laws, we have very complex laws. These laws can you know lead to very complex commitments and obligations to individuals who are you know in a, within a community and so on. We can make perfect sense of the idea that the as a result of these laws, individuals under certain commitments, under certain kind of obligations, that there are certain kind of normative concepts applying to them. But I, I think it's um, I would not be, um, um, I, I don't think that the notion of computability um, is, is really figuring into that. So I personally think that, um, I mean, not personally, I think that there's a good case to be made here that insofar as we're talking here about a normative concept, um, the notion of um, the connection to computability is not, um, is not irresistible. But I think it's really important. One principle of normativity, going back to Kant, is odd implies can. You can't tell people to do things they can't possibly do, and that's going to be true if you take some approaches to logic that ignore the computational limitations of any real physical okay, system. But, but the, the, the odd implies can. Okay, let's talk about that. I mean, like, you know, logic doesn't tell you that you ought to draw all the logical inferences, maybe partly because you can't to all these kind of inference, uh, can't draw all these kind of inferences, but that's not the commitment we're talking about. The fact that you are committed to phi doesn't mean that you're committed to drawing the inference that phi. So I think uh, there, you know, um, the, we normative guys are all very happy with um, good old Kant. Yeah, and I also think it's important to re keep in mind that the complexity of these non-monotonic inference or belief reversion methods that we talked about uh, is actually not that bad. There's a number of isolation results that show that uh, if you want to really revise your belief by P, of course, if you look at the whole combinatoric or set of all you believe, then you end up with zillions. Uh, but you actually only need to change a very little part of it uh, and keep all the rest unchanged. So, so even there, uh, I think the odd implies can argument loses a lot of grip because we can do a lot of this revision without ending up in a computational morass. But I mean, let's shift it from these abstract computational considerations to real practical ones, considering questions about what should people believe about vaccines or about climate change. I mean, I think these are things where philosophers have lots to say. It should be highly relevant. But how are you going to do that? Well, there's two things you need. You need an understanding of how minds work, and you need an understanding of how you can make them work better. I thought the last talk was very useful in pointing out that it's not just a matter of looking at the reasoning processes. You also want to look at the social interactions and the world in which people are having. I think that's all very useful. Yeah, so I, I think all of that's good. But I think, I'm a philosopher. I think philosophy should be normative. That's great. But it should be normative in a way that can actually tie into people's lives. And so you have to make sure that you're talking about minds that are operating with a set of principles that can be improved. Uh, and so that's not just an issue of abstract computability. That's a question of how can we make the world better by helping people to think better. I'm sure we're all in favor of making the world better. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, I think what, what, what I understood from the, the talks this afternoon is they addressed a very interesting question of how should we make people to believe the correct thing, for example, about vaccination or about some policies. And in that question, we have to understand how the brain works and the cognitive bias. But what should the people believe about vaccination and policy? Uh, that's a question for epistemology, which concerns what are the evidence pros uh, and the evidence against, how to weigh that evidence. And it's something these model of uh, this logical model can actually talk about very well. Uh, non monotonic reasoning in default theory, for example, is a very precise theory of how should we weigh contradicting evidence uh, and reach conclusion on the basis of that, either, either in a cautious or uh, in uh, less cautious ways. So, 
again, the question about what should we believe is a different one than how should we make people believe the right thing. Uh, and I think the question of what should we believe is some, something that, that still is a classical epistemological one. And, and j just to talk about, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the sort of reasoning architecture and so on, right? I mean, when I mean, when we want to choose what to believe, I mean, one of the procedures we have in place is, I mean, the I mean, scientific method, right? And the scientific method is a way of constraining our reasoning and putting ourselves in a, in a community, right? So a lot of what I was saying about, I mean, level three and level four debiasing is already enacted in the scientific community. So I mean, I think that. Here, I mean, we have clear examples of how the, I mean, these things can be implemented, and we have, I mean, some I mean, good and interesting results coming out of that. Uh, I, mean, I mean, then, I mean, of course, I mean, there's always this concern of, I mean, when will, I mean, we make a decision, we choose an option, then it might, we might discover later on that it's a bad option or it's not an ideal one or something like that. I mean, that's why, uh, it, in response to your questions or in Q&A, I was like, well, I mean, it depends on I mean, your goal, right? It depends on what you really want to do. But the thing is that if uh, you don't do it, or I mean, if people who care about, say, the well-being of people don't want to do it, other people will use these strategies, right? So when you go to the grocery store, someone already has thought how to display things so that you buy some things and less of other things. And I mean, so to think about that, I think, is also really, really important. And so in the what to believe, there's also the, I mean, the, the, the question of how people get to make choices in general in their everyday lives. And I think this is, I think this is something really, really crucial that we uh, can focus on and we can think about. Yeah. Yeah, I think once again, like bringing a little bit the ancients in, right? I mean, like I think we, um, you know, want to distinguish between. I mean, there was this old distinction between logic and rhetoric, or philosophy and rhetoric, right? I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, that one of the um, goals of, you know, one of the original ideas of logic and you know, kind of stuff that maybe more logicians are still doing is something like, you know, wasn't the search of truths, right? You know, and and getting you from certain truths to other truths and so on. Um, so that's, you know, and, and rhetoric, I mean, I mean, by, by your own, uh, I mean, like these kind of tools and techniques that you are suggesting are, you know, of course, the kind of things that can be used for good or bad, right? I mean, so, so I think, you know, there is, um, so I think what, what, what one sees here is that, I, I think, I mean, there's still a lot to learn from that, but I, and the way I, I mean, what I learn is something like from the, what I take home is, you know, that, there is something like this kind of label of worldly rhetoric, which of course is much more sophisticated than back in the ancient, right? But um, I mean, that this is like really, you know, this is like maybe a very important thing for, you know, public policy, for making the lives of individuals better. So it's not like a shady art or something like that. It's something that is, um, you know, doing an important role. Though I would still think, you know, that we might want to distinguish rhetoric from, you know, the kind of stuff that, you know, that, that logicians do and so on. It's not just logic versus rhetoric, it's getting the logic right. So let me give you a very concrete example. Has anybody been watching the O.J. Simpson documentary that's on? It's, okay, anyway, it's, it's really great because it talks about, the, but any legal trial, you're concerned not only with <coughs> finding a hypothesis about guilt that explains the evidence, you're also concerned with motive. They always ask about motive. Why, why did the criminal, accused criminal do it? Was it for greed or lust or anger or something like that? So you need to have a logic that can simultaneously consider a hypothesis, its relation to the evidence, hypothesis in comparison with other hypotheses, and the underlying background causes of the, mech of the hypothesis. Beliefs and, yeah. des and uh, desires and things like that. Yeah. In the mind, presumed in the mind of the, the person. That's right. So you have to consider all these things at once. How do you do that? Well, Wilfred Sellers and then Gilbert Harmon talked about explanatory coherence. I showed that you can take ideas about explanatory coherence and run them in neural networks and compute all these things at once. So it's not, it's logic, it's, it's the way I think it ought to be done, it's normative, uh, but it does two things. First of all, it indicates how you can simultaneously consider hypotheses and their alternatives and the evidence and the higher level hypotheses in any number of layers, do it in a computationally efficient way and generate a result that corresponds to what people do when they do it right, which I'm concerned with. That's, that's normative. It also gives you a very natural way of figuring out why people do it wrong sometimes, that is, the different kinds of biases go in. But just even for getting the logic right, I think this kind of coherence approach is better as logic for understanding that kind of inference, which is much more typically the kind of abductive inference that we do all the time in contrast to deductive inferences, which I think occur really very rarely in real life.
other questions or comments? I think, I think that you, we're all a little tired. And we have another wonderful program for tomorrow. And we have also a whole week next week. So <laughs> I'm, I think we have to uh, end the session and thank our five speakers. Yes.